New York, January 1959. Scene of the most daring sleep deprivation experiment ever attempted. Disc jockey Peter Tripp decided to raise money for charity by staying awake for 200 hours, eight days and nights. If successful, it was to be the longest period of uninterrupted wakefulness ever recorded. I don't think anyone thought Peter Tripp was going to stay awake more than two or three days. Have you ever tried to stay awake before an exam for one night? It kills you. <laughs> well, eight hey, days is impossible. Oh, pardon me. In 1953, Jolly West had been a young psychiatrist working at a U.S. Air Force base in Texas. He treated a group of American pilots who'd been captured by Chinese communists in the Korean War. The Chinese had tortured the prisoners by preventing them from sleeping. I felt that some of the Air Force POWs had not recovered their former personality function after they returned. Uh, they told me that they weren't themselves. On January 20th, 1959, Tripp launched his attempt to break the world record for sleeplessness. To maximize publicity for the March of Dimes charity, he broadcast his show from a studio in the middle of Times Square. He was a very cheerful, upbeat guy, and that's what we observed at the very beginning. He called himself uh, Mother's Little Curly Head Boy, <laughs> and away he went. He would spin his records not four hours a day, but 24 hours a day, and he would chatter and answer his phone calls and do the whole disc jockey's shtick. While New Yorkers listened in their millions, the doctors kept Trip under constant observation. As the hours mounted, it became harder for them to keep him awake. When studies are of sleep deprivation are done, I always wonder what measures they took to keep the person awake. Because when we studied Peter Tripp, that was our objective, to make absolutely certain that he stayed awake, and we did. I had the graveyard shift. From midnight till 8 o'clock in the morning, I had my eyes focused on that guy because after two or three days, you can imagine, he wanted to play games, you know. He'd want me to look out the window at something. <laughs> well, he'd catnap a few seconds. We never did do that. We wouldn't let him do this. He would say, now I'll just go to the bathroom a few minutes, and it'll be out. We said, oh, we're going to go to the bathroom with you. Oh, he was mad and incensed, but finally he said, we said, look, if you got the bathroom to sit down, you're going to go to sleep, don't you know? The whole experiment's over. Oh, he said, okay. So as inconvenient and as awkward as it was, we were with this man constantly. By the third day, Tripp's behavior had begun to change. He was abusing everyone around him, even his barber, who he'd known for years. Peter began cursing the barber, really being terrible to him and insulting him, and the barber cried. <laughs> he didn't understand this. He began crying when Peter cursed him. His mean body temperature progressively declined over this period of time, and the lower it went, the crazier he got. Tripp had begun to see things that weren't there. He mistook one of the doctors for an undertaker who'd come to bury him. He ran into the street, terrified. At first, the medical team were puzzled by the hallucinations. But then they made a surprising discovery. When we sleep, we enter a period of REM sleep every 90 minutes. It's during this stage that we dream. Tripp's brainwaves showed that although he was awake, the hallucinations were shadowing the 90-minute cycle of dream sleep. There was a 90-minute cycle of uh, relative confusion and relative clarity that would ebb and flow. And during the time that he would, if he were sleeping, have had uh, REM sleep, those were the times he was most likely to hallucinate.